advertisements, the intricate yet invasive and most persistently annoying ways companies try to get our attention. Advertisements have existed since the ancient Egyptian times, and in today's world, advertisements are everywhere. Now, since the mid 19th century, the modern advertisement as we know it has evolved and is everywhere to be found, of course. Drive along the highway, you see an advertisement. Walk along the street, you see an advertisement. In today's digital age, advertisements play a significant role in generating a substantial source of revenue for platforms. We tend to see them as just a really an annoying waste of time. But the advertisement industry is very lucrative. It is estimated that the global advertising revenue in 2021 reached up to 763.2 billion US dollars. The advertisement model is relatively straightforward. You have a platform, whether that be a newspaper, a TV station, or a website, and a company, or oftentimes an advertising agency, will reach out on behalf of the company to place advertisements on this platform. Now, in return, the platform will receive some compensation. Now, when it comes to the world of digital advertising, the economics of scale are quite helpful. A company can now target a user based off of previous search history and other factors to deliver targeted advertisements. With targeted digital advertisements, companies can understand what works based off of click rate, number of impressions, and many more statistics I really don't know what I'm talking about. So, with these new digital platforms, which are mostly websites, a company can now charge a premium for advertising agencies, and once again, the platform gets compensated. Now, what if there was a way to exploit or perhaps trick these advertising agencies into giving you a source of that revenue by just simply serving up some random content and ads? In this video, I'm going to be outlining the short story of Alexander Zukov and the methbot network that he orchestrated to fraud advertising networks out of millions of dollars worth of advertising funds. In 2016, a cybersecurity firm issued a report on an actively maintained botnet coined as MethBot. The cybersecurity firm, WhiteOps, reported that they had been tracking this new botnet believed to originate in Russia, although it was not believed to be state-sponsored. They called it MethBot due to the references of meth in the computer code. The report outlined the overall operation of MethBot, including the operational infrastructure, techniques used to avoid detection, and estimated financial impact of its operation. WhiteOps came to its discovery by noticing a small amount of automated web traffic featuring a unique bot signature that had been previously identified. This bot signature was quarantined until October of 2016, when the bot finally morphed into MethBot and they began to see scaling. At the time, WhiteOps was the only credible source to make this allegation, but cybersecurity news outlets and general news outlets started to pick up the story with the headlines and claims of millions of dollars of stolen advertising funds. So how does MethBot work? There are two sides of the MethBot operation. Since advertising is a two-party ecosystem, you have the viewer and then the publisher or the platform, uh, there could be considered a third party, which is the advertising agencies, acting as the intermediary. MethBot had to simulate both human audiences and the premium publishers who had audiences to sell to. The operators behind MethBot rented servers with the goal of impersonating users while hosting seemingly harmless-looking websites, impersonating these premium publishers. The success of renting data center servers was a new type of botnet operation at the time, but I'm going to get back to this in a moment. To start with the platforms, MethBot operators used names of prestigious publishers who had strong brand recognition. It is believed that MethBot rented up to 1,900 servers, which served 5,000 plus websites and 250,000 plus unique URLs. And each of these websites would house a video ad. Video advertising on premium websites fetches some of the highest prices in digital advertising. These domains appear to look like famous publishers. MethBot selected a domain or URL from a list of publishers, counterfeited it to support this video ad, and then this led to an ad selection algorithm to select these fake web pages and then charge these advertising agencies a premium to display their video ads on the website. To simulate human users, the perpetrators use several techniques to make websites appear popular. First off, 
Over 570,000 unique and dedicated IP addresses were used to make it appear as if users were coming across all different types of geographical locations, not just a Russian or United States IP address. These bots had custom programs which were used to execute clicks on websites and then watch these video ads while still mimicking normal user behavior. And to mimic this behavior, Methbot operators crafted cookies into fake web sessions, which contain information that appear to be valuable for advertisers. Often, they rely on this data stored in user machines for targeted advertising, such as looking at the past purchases, history, and many other data points. They also simulated cursor movements, used fake social network login information to appear as if the user was logged into their social media accounts, and had browser plugins installed on these bot-infected servers to appear as if the user was logged in when this ad impression occurred. Okay, so transitioning back to the botnet or the type of botnet operation. Data center-based ad fraud is a significant priority for data centers and ISPs. If their IP ranges are flagged as hosting malicious web content, their IP addresses will get flagged by these ISPs, and then the ISPs will block that content. So ISPs and data centers try to stay on top of malicious users hosting fraudulent content. Now to suppress this limitation, traditionally ad fraud operators relied on malware that infected residential computers sitting behind a consumer-grade router. These IP addresses are legitimate because users pay ISPs to lease public IP addresses, making it harder for ISPs to detect malicious activity. The Methbot operators knew this wasn't going to be the most efficient way to accomplish the scale of simulating human users. So they built infrastructure used to remove these limitations. Using dedicated proxies, which function as an intermediary which masks these servers' real IP addresses, the Methbot operators were able to rent network equipment from data centers located in Texas, United States, and European countries, primarily the Netherlands. A sizable number of servers that the Methbot operation rented and utilized were owned and maintained by companies affiliated with XBT Holdings, which is owned by a Russian venture capitalist named Alexei Gubarev. XPT Holdings had servers located in Texas which could be used, so using methods like this, the Methbot operators could accomplish the scale and redundancy that data centers provide while still appearing as a legitimate operation. At Methbot's peak, it was believed the operators were pocketing between 3 to 5 million US dollars per day. Now, within the White Ops report, they consulted a media intelligence company who generated a rough list of CPMs based off of the URL and brand being spoofed. The CPM ranged from $3.27 to $36.72. Cost per mile, or CPM, is used to note the price of 1,000 advertisement impressions on one web page. So, if a website platform charges a $5 CPM, then for 1,000 impressions of an ad, an advertiser should expect a $5 bill. Methbot was generating anywhere from 2 to 300 million ad impressions per day using their sophisticated bot network, translating to millions stolen in advertising funds. So in the end, it was believed anywhere from 180 million to up to 1 billion US dollars was stolen in some way through this fraud Methbot network. Although, depending on the news source you look at, it is believed that the original White Ops report massively exaggerated the fraud numbers. Now, from a personal opinion and based off of what I researched, Alexander Zukov had a fine of $3.8 million to pay back when he got sentenced, meaning eh, $180 to $1 billion seems a little bit exaggerated. But that is what is believed to have gotten the Methpot network revenue. Okay, so speaking of Alexander Zukov, who was the mastermind behind Methbot? Well, it was discovered it was Alexander Zukov, of course. He was the brains and leader of this intricate network of bots. Zukov recruited computer programmers and other employees to help him accomplish the technical feats of his scheme. How did Alexander Zukov get caught? Part of the credit goes to the Trustworthy Accountability Group, or TAG for short. TAG is an information sharing and analysis organization that helps protect advertising industries by collecting and disseminating data about fraud. According to TAG, participating companies help expose this fraud operation and share their threat intelligence with other industry peers. 
Tag member organizations found signs of domain spoofing, which were then shared with authorities, leading to the FBI to open a new investigation. This investigation lasted more than a year and a half, which resulted in the arrests of three suspects who were apprehended in Bulgaria, Malaysia, and Estonia. The FBI played a significant role in collecting digital evidence and eventually finding out who the ring leader was through infiltrating within, which then eventually led to Alexander Zhukov. On November 8, 2021, just about three years after Zukov's arrest, Zukov was sentenced to 10 years in prison in order to pay $3.5 million in cash for the damages that occurred through MethBot's operation. So what can we learn from the MethBot's operation as just, you know, end users like you and I? Well, first off, cleverness. I mean, you have to give credit to Alexander Zukov and his ring of programmers who went out and developed this intricate network of bots, which was redundant and scalable and able to scam these advertising agencies who were just willing to shell over, you know, millions of dollars worth of their funds. A second lesson you can take away from this is that implicit trust doesn't really work so much all the time on the internet. I mean, it's implicit trust and you could or could not have the results. So always be wary as an end user when you're giving over information to another party. And that means advertising agencies, in this case being the victims, just giving over their funds to seemingly innocent looking websites. So that was the MethBots operation in the short story of Alexander Zukov. If you've enjoyed today's video, uh, that's all I really care about. All sources will be linked in the description below. It couldn't, this video could not have been made possible without any of the sources, of course. Yeah, so until the next time, uh, yeah, have a good day.